Hi everyone, this is Casey with Foundation Testing and Consulting. In today's video, I'm going to talk about your options if you have a CSL test, cross hole sonic logging test, performed for a drill shaft, and the report indicates that you have an anomaly in the shaft. So an anomaly is an area of concern that may be a, an area of lower quality concrete, whether it's some washout of the cement paste or some inclusion of soil or rock material. But at any rate, the CSL practitioner, if they've identified an anomaly, they'll identify it in the CSL report. And then where do you go from there? So typically for drilled shafts for Department of Transportation bridge projects, it's often the case that they'll perform a destructive core, either through essentially portable equipment or with a geotechnical drill rig set up over the top of the drilled shaft. And the idea is to conduct a core to that target uh, where the anomaly is located and get a further assessment as to what materials there and what could have caused the anomaly. And certainly if there's additional cores performed, get a better idea as to the extent of the anomaly. Now, some states are more inclined to core shaft if a CSL anomaly is identified. It really depends on the extent of the anomaly, the location of the anomaly, and what the design implications would be relative to the required performance for that drilled shaft. Now I can tell you through past research and my own experience, we find that the majority of drilled shaft anomalies are located at the base of the shaft. That's the location where the concrete placement is initiated using a trimmy. That's the place where there's often water at the base of the rock socket in the drilled shaft. That's also the place where if material falls in, that is where it'll accumulate. Oftentimes, the initial material that comes in, let's say it becomes, has some deleterious uh, components in it, either through mixing with water and washing out of cement paste and fine aggregate, or the inclusion of soil and rock material, uh, usually that poorer quality material or questionable quality material will accumulate at the outer perimeter of the shaft, sort of like a, a ring, like a donut. So it's quite often the case where the CSL test will identify an anomaly, but it may be quite limited in extent. And it's often the case that you can identify the anomaly uh, with a CSL test, but you won't be able to intersect it effectively with a destructive core. And the main reason for that is that you often have to offset to the interior of the shaft at least six inches, so that when you core, there's inevitable drift in the position of the core in a horizontal plane, and that uh, could end up deviating quite a bit from your intended location, and you certainly don't want to destroy your reinforcing steel. And if that happens before you've, uh, if you've intersected the reinforcing steel or a CSL steel access tube before you've reached your target depth, you'll lose uh, thousands of dollars in drill tooling, and you'll have to restart the hole. So what's the main reason for bothering to core shaft. So it depends on the design requirements. Uh, a drill shaft with a rock socket can have a combination of side friction or, and end bearing. It could have end bearing alone, or it could have side friction alone. Those are the options. And through Osterberg load cell testing, at least in our region, we find that typically less than 15% of the applied load at the top of the shaft is actually transferred into end bearing. So even if a shaft is designated as entirely end bearing, the physics of it are such that that's seldom the case. But let's say we've cored the shaft and we identify an area of, of weaker concrete or inclusion of some soil or rock material. Uh, what are your options? Now I will say there's often the case where you core a shaft and you get a zone of no recovery. And sometimes people erroneously label such zones as voids. That's not the case. That's a zone of washout. The material was weak enough such that it couldn't remain intact and make it to the inner barrel of the coring equipment. So as the drill bit turns on the end of the drill rod, as that material stays at the, at the face of the drill bit, it gets ground up and washed away in the drilling fluid. So another thing that you can do, and we've done in many instances, is if you can evacuate that, the water from inside the core in the shaft, 
uh, we actually do underwater camera video observation. I say underwater because it's a tough environment, but you want to evacuate the water from the hole to get a much better image quality. But at any rate, it's good to run a camera down into those zones to see what the condition of the sidewall for the core is. If you find that you have a, a nice, consistent, smooth core, it's, uh, you can identify that the core has cut through the coarse aggregate and uh, there's no oversized section of the core. So that's larger than the nominal diameter that suggests some weaker material pulled in in the process of coring. Uh, it can go a long way to assuring the shaft owner and the shaft designer that the material is much better in situ than it may have appeared from then from performing the core. So another thing that we can do, it's often the case that let's say we got lucky and we intersected a very isolated anomaly that was at the perimeter of the shaft with the core. So the next question is, well, does this area of weaker concrete represent a, a very large percentage of the shaft cross section? So another thing that can be done, and we've done it many times, is to do cross hole sonic logging but if the uh, core hole can, in this case, ma maintain water to at least the elevation that's above your zone of interest, you can do cross hole sonic logging with a uh, probe in the core hole and then probes in the uh, remaining CSL access tubes. And in that way, you can very well define uh, the extent and severity of the anomaly. Uh, now, prior to coring, it may be worthwhile to do a special type of cross hole sonic logging test, and that's called CSL tomography. So in a typical CSL survey, the transmitter and receiver probes at the end of the cables, which are connected to the data acquisition system, are lowered to the very bottom of the shaft, and the slack's taken out of the cables, and the cables are pulled up together, and typically you're collecting data every two inches of vertical length of shaft. In the tomography instance, you'll actually offset the position of the transmitter and receiver relative to the horizontal plane. Uh, common angle is about 15 degrees. And so in that way, you can use special tomographic software and generate color-coded visual representations of the velocity profile at various sections representing various depths in your drill shaft. And you can also compile what looks like a 3D volume to get a better visualization of what's there. So that's extremely useful to assess whether the shaft can be accepted as is, uh, or if a repair is required, what's the most likely repair option that should be utilized. And the tomographic survey can also indicate how effective that repair is likely to be. So there are instances where the zone of interest at the base of the shaft may have just some slight degradation in concrete quality such that it's not a good target or a good candidate for conventional drill shaft repair methods such as pressure grouting. So knowing that might favor other types of repair methods. And uh, I'll go into those options in a subsequent video. I just want to lay out the fact that if you have a CSL anomaly, it doesn't mean you have a flaw or a defect. That terminology should only be applied once an engineering evaluation has been performed uh, of the drill shaft requirements relative to the extent and severity that's indicated by the CSL test result. So a flaw would indicate, yeah, that's something that doesn't meet spec, but it's not something we necessarily like to see in a drill shaft, but we're, we're still able to accept the shaft because it'll meet the performance requirements based on the design. And then a defect usually implies in my mind that the anomaly consists of material that's of enough poor quality that a repair has to be made or a replacement shaft has to be installed. And uh, I'd say it's common now that you're able to repair these shafts. Uh, you shouldn't have to automatically uh, replace the shaft, but again, uh, a lot of money can be spent and time in an effort to repair a shaft, and the outcome is not always certain. So in those cases, depending on project schedule and other requirements, it may be more efficient to uh, simply replace the shaft if that's an option. That usually involves some redesign of the cap. So again, it's important for the design engineer and the owner to 
assess what the extent of the anomaly is and really evaluate, can the shaft be accepted as is? So the goal shouldn't be, well, the goal should be perfection, but the reality in construction is that you seldom get perfection in a drill shaft installation because it's a tough environment for placing concrete. So with that mindset, uh, I think it would help if the owner, the contractor, and the designer worked in a collaborative spirit to really determine the best way forward when a drill shaft anomaly has been identified. The other thing that can be done is if a shaft anomaly is accepted for a drill shaft, it may be that the contractor, and I would recommend this, would assess what caused the anomaly and make modifications to their installation means and methods to avoid future anomaly occurrences with subsequent shaft placements on that project. So they may have to change uh, how they're using the trimmy. Uh, we see a lot of instances where the end condition or the, the closure condition of the trimmy is problematic. Uh, so there's a lot of details associated with that. But again, the purpose of today's video is to let you know that having a drill shaft anomaly is not the end of the world necessarily, uh, although it can be uh, quite costly and can lead to a lot of delays on a project because these are important structures. I mean, they're, they're holding up a bridge that's gonna be open to traffic for 50 to 75 plus years. So it's important to get these right. It's important to understand the condition of the concrete and to understand what the design and performance implications are. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to me through my contact information. If you like this content, please hit the subscribe and notification buttons because I will be issuing a lot of additional videos on the specifics of drill shaft testing involving a variety of methodologies. So thanks very much for watching.